This video is going to be about, um, this is from my year 13s, thinking about uh, King Lear and criticism and what is called, uh, in this exam board, AO5, alternative interpretations. And what we're going to think about is, oh, I'm going to use Emma Smith's uh, idea as a framing narrative that actually the play goes through three major eras of reinterpretation. Um, and just to think about it, I'm just going to start with this image from Peter Brook's 1971 film, my absolute favorite uh, film version of King Lear, the one I recommend all of you watch um, with the subtitles on and with the subtitles off. Um, I think to watch the play, um, watch the movie a few times, and you'll really come to grips with what, I mean, what I think certainly is working in, on in the play. Um I think it's worth thinking about this question, how can one play, how can one text mean different things? And how do I demonstrate that I can read the play in different ways and still argue a thesis? So, you know, students who try and um, say, on the one hand this, on the other hand this, on the one hand this, on the other hand this, they're um, the most, uh, those make the most unconvincing essays. What you're trying to realize with a complex literary and imaginative writer is, the language, the drama, and the structure, um, particularly in terms of a play, uh, in terms of staging, um, in terms of the way uh, the way we actually bring emphasis to certain words and not others, it can have a radical uh, change in the meaning of what we're actually seeing and understanding. And one way of thinking about this um, is really thinking about uh, Emma Smith's idea that... Um, and, you know, again, I really, really rate this book uh, based on a number of her lectures that she gives for free online. You can get them, uh, her Oxford lectures. It's just an absolutely excellent, clear, very provocative um, book. I, I cannot recommend this book enough. Um, she, what she's done is kind of, she's taken this idea um, from Terry Eagleton, where he's trying to figure out what tragedy is. And he has come up and he, you know, he realizes that you can't really say very much more than tragedy is something that's really sad. And at most, he argues provocatively, something that's really, really sad. That's about as far, because tragedy is such a large concept that involves so many contradictory ideas. It's so hard to pin down. That's about all you can say. And she, she, sa she takes this and provocatively applies this to the history of King Lear criticism over the past um, few hundred years. And she comes up with something, which is to say, the play is too sad, and it shouldn't be. And this is the first era of criticism that, of course, all, I mean, I could argue that almost every essay, almost every critic has to deal with Samuel Johnson's uh, comments on the play, that the the ending doesn't give us um, justice. There's no sense of natural justice. So he defends Nam Tate's rewriting of the play as a comedy because he sees it as giving us moral certitude. So he says, okay, the play isn't, is too sad and, and it need not be, and it shouldn't be to, to realize its moral strength. Um, in contrast, there are these subsequent critics that say, oh, the play's really sad. It's too sad, but there's reason. And there are two, two, parts of this. They're the romantic critics that see in Shakespeare a kind of messy intensity, something like what they refer to as the sublime, something so terrifically horrific and terrible that it gives you insight into the universe. There's some, there's some power and force and energy that is out there. And the obvious way we would apply that would be uh, to ascribe this to God, which would give us another set of critics, Christian critics, who might argue. I don't. All of this is oversimplification, by the way. I would really encourage you to read Emma Smith and then go back, of course, to the source material. This is oversimplification. However, for the sake of oversimplification, Christian critics who see in Lear's suffering a pattern of Christian um, uh, 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 patience, um, uh, pain, and redemption. Following that comes our more modern critics, uh, the, these nihilistic, uh, this nihilistic uh, world that we live in, which finds the notion of God as present in the text as utterly comical um, and rejects this completely and says, okay, no, no, the play is really, really sad and for no actual reason and that's kind of what 
the world is. There is no reason that we are dark beings on a planet uh, in a universe where God is indifferent, at best, doesn't exist, at worst, whether well, that's worse or not, I don't know. And what we're dealing with is, um, what we're dealing with is a universe where he, there is no, there is no God. And, and Lear actually is an amazing text to explore that idea. So I'm just working through some of these, um, see these pages in this um, booklet I've created and that you have. Um, I will just be shuffling through it back and forth. So let's go back to these guys. Okay, so these guys are named Tate and um, Samuel Johnson. Now, Tate, what he did was he rewrote the play. He referred to uh, the play as a heap of jewels, unstrung and unpolished, um, and which is really old. Um, he rewrote the ending, so Cordelia and Lear are reunited. Cordelia marries Edgar. Um, remember, um, uh, she doesn't get, in fact, married in 1-1, as in Lear's. Um, he, Tate, removes the fool as a character that doesn't seem to make much sense to him. Um, and it's worth thinking about from an AO3 perspective why these cultural changes so, brief, so soon after Shakespeare's death, the play is almost incomprehensible. Well, Samuel Johnson in 1765 argues um, that he defends uh, Tate's rewrite, and he argues that the wicked prosper and the virtuous miscarry in Shakespeare's version. Um, and what that means, in a way, is the bad guys get away with too much. And he, and he goes further, and he says, you know, he was so shocked by Cordelia's death, um, and he, he couldn't handle reading it until he had to edit the play. Um, that's pretty amazing. That's a pretty remarkable, like, genuine emotional reaction he's having there. Uh, if, if evil prospers, it could be a good play because it's a just representation of the common events of human life. But since we all naturally love justice, I cannot easily be persuaded, he argues, that the observation of justice makes a play worse or that if other excellences are equal, the audience will not always rise better pleased for the final triumph of persecuted virtue. So this is a really interesting idea Johnson has, which is to say that, okay, look, maybe this is a reflection of the world, but that's not what we go to art for. We go for some, we go for moral virtue. We go to learn something. We, we, go, we go to get a sense of what justice looks like and, and how, should it, how it should appear, it seems to me he's arguing. And that when we go to Tate's version, we get a sense of we get a sense of coherence, and that we don't get from Shakespeare's. Now that's a very provocative statement that is worth you pausing on and thinking about. And I would say to you that every essay on Lear should really start with these two. And of course, Nam Tate is a production, and Samuel Johnson is a critic. So this is a wonderful way of getting Ao three and Ao five. Sorry to be so Ao obsessed. But you, you can see where I'm coming from further if you think about the ending and structural changes. Actually, in one moment, you've really set up your essay with AO2 structure, the structure of the play, what are the changes that Tate makes, um, why the audience would like that, why that would be an important thing, and then how the critical defense of that. Well, what we can see now is almost the entire critical history debates um, Johnson because what we have is... Um, the next era of critics, the romantic critics, I haven't put them all here, um, but um, you could talk about someone like, I mean, this is a really, um, you, you could, this is a really famous painting really to express this concept I'm going to bring up about the sublime, the, ter the beautiful terror brought from nature. Um, Schlegel, uh, the German critic Schlegel said, the play portrays a fall from the highest elevation to the deepest abyss of misery, where humanity is stripped of all eternal and internal advantages and given up a prey to naked helplessness. Unlike Johnson, he doesn't seem to be condemning this. He seems to think that um, uh, actually um, by showing this, this, this work is actually something amazing. Uh, Coleridge says similar things, arguing that, um, um, that, that Shakespeare... Uh, 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 here he goes. Uh, di he didn't argue, argue, uh, admire Shakespeare's presentation of power in itself without reference to any moral end, because it led to complacency and admiration of a tyrant like Bonaparte or the foam and thunder 
of a waterfall. Again, it's the power of the piece, the energy, the brutality of it that gives us some insight, or, or he argues Shakespeare is giving us some insight into how these things work. And it's really interesting to pair Bonaparte and nature. Um, I could give you other people like Hazlitt, but I think the person we really need to think about and why I put his picture on the side is, is um, of course, um, Ke uh, Keats's uh, very famous sonnet where, where, where we can really understand. Well, firstly, remember, he's reading it. And if you go to the context video, we remind ourselves that what, what Keats isn't doing is watching the play. He considers it a poem. And from it, a poem that consumes him and like a phoenix gives him new wings of flight. That in this, we get a real sense of an accentuation of what is it that makes this play so powerful. Uh, Johnson wants it to be end uh, to end differently, to give moral certitude and correct virtue. Whereas for for Keats, it is this consumption of the self. It is this brutality and something of watching. Well, here he reads. I would argue watching a play that can make you feel like this intensity is for a reason, and somehow it renews us, kind of like the mythical phoenix born up out of its wing. Well, this idea, so the play is too sad, but there's reason for the sadness, can also be applied to Christian critics, like, like again, I'll just show you their pictures. Um, this is a gross oversimplification, so any big, hardcore, Lear critics and nerds, please forgive me. Um, I, I'm, you know, Obviously, everything I'm saying is, should be taken with pounds and pounds of salt, but this is the way I read it. That for critics like A.C. Bradley, um, the play was, is, starts to demonstrate a kind of allegory of suffering and God's patience. Um, he, he argues, and I think it just expresses it, that he would like the play renamed The Redemption of King Lear. Um, he argues, we must renounce the world, hate it, lose it gladly. The only thing in it is the soul with its courage, patience, devotion, and nothing outward can touch that. You get other critics who, who say um, uh, similar things from a Christian standpoint, but what you might think about is how would these critics argue with Johnson? Well, Johnson's wrong. The wicked do not triumph, right? Cornwall's killed by the virtuous servant. Oswald clubbed to death uh, when trying to kill Closter. Christian readings present the fool as the height of innocent Christian wisdom. Um, G. Wilson Knight um, argues the place suffering was part of a purgatorial process of self-knowledge. So in Christianity, this suffering is aimed towards something, not nothing. Here we have um, Frank Kermode, who's absolutely excellent critic. I wouldn't at all want to say he was overly simplistic in presenting this as a Christian play, but he does say some interesting things that I think are worth noting about how the play could be read within a Christian context. Um, he argued that the play's always, you know, he argued that the play is actually about language and the play is always thinking about the last days, the apocalypse doomsday, he quotes from the play. Is this the promised end or the image of that horror? Um, he also talks about when Kent, uh, in the role of Caius, is so angry with Oswald, he talks about like rats off bit the holy cords a twain, you know, to, 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 to bite rats, biting the ropes to let go of everything that holds our society together. Well, this is the end of the world, Kermode says. He argues that the understanding, the immense suffering in the play and the seeming silence of God, we need to look back at the book of Job. Um, but unlike Job, of course, Lear is not restored. He doesn't get rewarded. Um, he, 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 says, um, he says that uh, he, he, does, he doesn't fully agree with Bradley because he says if, it's almost comical to say the suffering has a redemptive purpose, quoting Edgar, who can say, I'm worst, worse I may be yet. Suffering is a torture in the play. Just when tolerable conclusion is in sight, something happens to make it worse. Lear sent out his madness, Gloucester's eyes out, Gloucester's eyes out rather, losing the battle, Cordelia's death, all of these things. It just gets worse and worse and worse. He rejects an easy Christian reading, suggesting a more complex mystery to God's worth and the artistic representation of this logic. The play offers neither its good characters nor its audience any relief from its cruelty. 
We remember that all those images of the last judgment, so abundant in Italian churches here, he's talking about the Reformation and the cleansing of the imagery of the churches, are also full of cruel images of the damnation of impassioned clay. So, look, while Christian critics see in, so it's mostly Bradley, of course, that see this pattern of suffering, purgatorial purging, and that leads to redemption and um, uh, for, uh, savior, um, modern critics like Frank Kermode can see that, that that reading is possible, but is limited, actually, because the play is much more full of despair. And here we see why, because Frank Kermode, even though I placed him with the Christian critics, is probably closer to something like this last era, so these critics, it's again like like Johnson is to Tate, Brook, uh, sorry, Jan Cott is to Peter Brook. It's not an exact relationship, but I'm I'm about to walk you through this. So Jan Cott wrote a very uh, prominent and popular essay that influenced Peter Brook's um, stark and brutal uh, stage version and this absolute masterpiece of a movie, King Lear, which I recommend you again, once again, you all watch. Even though Peter Brook, by the way, I should just say as a side note, he doesn't see his movie as, as, as that despairing. He argues, in fact, that there is some kind of hope in the play. So, but, but let's just put that aside for now. So let's just look at this. This idea that the play is cruel and there's no meaning and there's no way of understanding this suffering, life is painful. So Fry, one of these other Christian critics, argued that, you know, he just pointed out that Lear's become so much popular than Hamlet since the end of the Second World War. And it's because now we have industrialized killing, uh, human beings being uh, uh, factory killed in the Holocaust or the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, you know, the horror and senseless suffering of the play makes sense to us because we're not squeamish about evil, about betrayal, about a hopeless world with silent gods. In fact, King Lear actually is a good play to actually take a look at this. Um, and, and Jen Cott says as much. Um, Stephen Greenblatt, who I'm going to talk about in the section, uh, rejects the idea, uh, rejects Bradley's idea completely that the play is about the soul. He says, no, 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 no. I don't know why I said it like that, but he, he would, this is actually a play about the body, storms, physical horror, an old king raging naked on the heath, poor Tom, Closter's eyes. It, you know, Greenblatt argues that the play links mental anguish with physical anguish. Here we get the rejection of the notion of a redemptive reading that this play is about the soul, not at all, not at all for modern critics. And you take these images of the bombing of Hiroshima, um, you take these images from the recovery of, um, uh, of, of prisoners in these death camps to help you see the play a bit differently. Um, here we have this notion, one of my favorite critical comments of all time, from Blau in 1966, we move from the idea of regeneration. Why does Cordelia have to die? Into why would she want to live? These char these critics start to note that a world dominated by such horror is so disgusting that we shouldn't want to live in it. And King Lear, seen in this way, actually is much closer to the theater of Samuel Beckett and Endgame, which is Jen Cott's idea that the barren brutality of Lear is a precursor to the bleak theater of Samuel Beckett. And this bleakness, this emptiness, this hopelessness, this, this absence of God's voice, um, we get this in the production of Peter Brooks. Very, very powerful and famous production. Here we have his Lear on the Heath or the destroyed house. That's from the stage production um, of Goneril. Um, for Cott, King Lear is a play about the disintegration of the world. The end of the play is the end of a gigantic pantomime, and the earth is left empty and bleeding. Cott says that the play shows the end of the world is emptiness. The play has no more kings and subjects, fathers or children, husbands or wives, just monsters devouring one another. Um, it, you know, in Peter Brooks' production, he, you know, from from what I from my reading, the torture scene um, was not very prompt. Even though Mac Reddy in 1834 restored um, the play to its original construction, much of the torture scene of Gloucester was done off stage, and I've seen productions where that still is the case. Peter Brook made it front and center. He made the visceral pain, 
brutality and suffering so prominent a part of the play. Um, now, all of this is to say that whereas Tate needed to change the ending to please the audience, and Samuel Johnson gave the critical defense of that as giving us some moral certitude, here we have Jan Cott saying the play is one of brutality, emptiness, the earth is bleeding, and Peter Brook's production kind of manifests that. So it's a kind of reversal, uh, critic first, production next, but nonetheless, it's this idea that the production and the critical interpretation take the same play and change it and open up and reinterpret it. Um, well, there's more we can say about this now. I'm not going to look at the complete um, uh, philosophical approaches. So I could argue, I could encourage you, as I do in the booklet, to think about psychoanalytic criticism as a way. But I really want you to think about feminist interpretation. And here are two main critics I want you to know and think about Lisa Jardine and Jean Howard. Um, you know, for these critics, it's really instructive that we think about uh, that. Uh, look, I'll say it like this. Whose tragedy is the play? We call the play the tragedy of King Lear. Uh, why isn't it Cordelia's tragedy? Like, once I read that, it really stopped me and made me start to think about why, what are, what are questions after the Second World War and into the 60s, what are philosophical questions that when we ask them, we start to see the text in a different way? Um, oops, sorry, sorry, I'm going to give you back. Uh, these are the two feminists, uh, uh, Lisa Jardine and Jean Howard. So here I am from Lisa Jardine. Jardine argues that Jack Jacobean drama's strong interest in women does not in fact reflect newly improved social conditions for women, but instead is related to the patriarchy's unexpressed worry, great social changes which characterize the period. Jean Howard, another feminist, um, uh, new historicists argued that the Jacobean stage increasingly showed the disciplining of women was a response to a strengthening of patriarchal authority in the family and the state alongside the production of sites of resistance and possibilities of new powers of women. This is from Lisa Jardine. Silence equals virtue, excessive speech disorder, and it is the virtue of silence that is best associated with Cordelia. By choosing the daughter that used more talking than necessary, Lear mistakes what was expected of women. Lear makes the wrong choice. He chooses not woman, disowns the truly womanly Cordelia. What these critics do, and you can look also at Marx's critics, again, as psychoanalytic critics, is following the Second World War, by asking different questions, we start to see the text in different ways. Shakespeare has been a particularly fertile site for debate and discussion because he is so complex um, a writer because his language and his drama is constantly and continually being reinterpreted, um, and it's yielding new meaning. And that is really what AO5, I guess, is about, is the fact that you can see something in a different way. If you'd like, you can look at the Marxist critics, um, who's in ascendancy right now is very much so, oops, let me just find myself, um, yep, yeah are these people called the new historicists, even though it's very kind of done. Um, as I've said, I'm not done, sorry, just not, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like 20 years out of fashion, so I don't even know what's, what's in anymore. But let's say Stephen Greenblatt, um, a new historicist, he's arguing, and you can look at my booklet in more detail, that look really simply, um, this play that all these certain critics looked at the the soul, actually, let's look at the body. Notice, I just shift focus to something else, and the play yields new meaning. James Shapiro, who's written a, you know, a really interesting and helpful book, 1606, um, he talks about how the play moves from, um, from the personal, the familial, to the metaphysical. I've just adapted that to think about the local and the familial, the national, the metaphysical, y you know, Every layer you go up to, it's doing something more. But what he's arguing is that the book, history, is embedded in the text, oh, not in the next, in the text. And if we can find it, it really yields greater interpretation. So there, I would say Shapiro, as a new historicist, really activates the notion of AO3, cultural, cultural and historical context. The more you know it, the more the play can mean something to you. But really, it just comes back, I think, for me, to this idea of Emma Smith's 
bringing it all together that the the play the critical history is actually a debate between three positions and if all your essays could begin with tate and johnson and already somewhere debate caught and brook you'll really have captured the idea of this enormously complex text having a very large debate and conversation over time so one way to think about this is to think about the play as being too sad Tate and Johnson, you change the ending to give more moral coherence to the play. There is, there's reason for the sadness. Well, there are different reasons for that sadness, and depending if you see the phoenix being reborn or if you see the Christian suffering, um, there's some reason to how the play acts as a kind of um, brutal exploration, but one that shouldn't demolish us. Whereas it's Cotton Brook ironically, and this is taking me a really a long time to come to grips with, they're, they're, they might not be as far away from Tate and Johnson, or more Johnson, than we may first see. This, They, they agree, seemingly, that there is a nihilism in the play. What they disagree with is that nihilism should be ignored, Tate Johnson, or should be rationalized, romantic or Christian. What they argue is this nihilism is what our culture is is and we can see that really in the wake of the second world war so what we see is this nihilism this this emptiness um is is for us to look at to look at ourselves and king there is an incredibly well positioned text to investigate what we are what do we owe one another but i would warn you and uh, here comes the frank Kermode in me remember um in very small moments there is hope there is Lear noticing the, the fool being cold. There is Lear noticing the suffering of others. There is uh, the servants asking for egg and flax to put on the Gloucester's wounds. There is the servant who accompanies Gloucester. There is um, the unnamed servant, of course, who stands up for Gloucester. There are all these moments, glimmers of hope in these different places. The play isn't only nihilistic, and Brooke says as much. He doesn't really see it that way. So as we never fix your notion of such a complex text in a single interpretation, there is always an opportunity to think about it more. Now, a more sophisticated way, perhaps, of thinking about theory and criticism is looking at critics who, after the Second World War, ask different questions. Feminists are the easiest ones to think about just by looking at the play as a woman to, to shift focus away from the male tragedy into looking at it from uh, multiple perspectives already takes you into a much more sophisticated and deep reading of the play. So when you're doing this, when you're engaging in using critics and writing about King Lear, I think what you should think about is a debate between different major figures. And Emma Smith offers you that, that, that kind of framing narrative. Okay, so so what we've done is what we've I've I've just taken you through some of the highlights of my this booklet I've written about um, oh I can't find the front page of the criticism of King Lear um, and I've talked you through Emma Smith's ideas and Emma Smith is basically you know for me it's like this Emma Smith Johnson Tate Keats Bradley. Caught Brook. These are the minimum skeletons to hold together an argument or the critical debate on any issue in King Lear. If you're interested in something more specific, you should go to those specific critics and start engaging in that discussion for yourself. And what you'll find is different critics will focus on different parts of the play. And the more you read a critic who enriches your understanding, and they model to you uh, ways of interpretation, asking questions, and how to build an argument that is convincing uh, and thorough to the reader. I hope that was some help for you. Um, if you want to keep the conversation going, please do send me an email. I'll see you soon. I hope. I don't know if I'll see you soon, but I hope I hear from you soon.